Hello, this is a uh, integrity recording. I'll make a two or three of them on general factorial experiments. So this is the beginning of where we transition from discussing one factor experiments to the more important aspect of experiments with two or more factors. And again, uh, just a quick um, recap of previous discussion. Uh, the term factorial experiment uh, coined by Sir R. A. Fisher in the 20s meant experiments with two or more factors at um, multiple levels. And we tend to call these factorial experiments, factorial designs. The idea is run one runs all combinations of possible factors and settings. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and move ahead. And a key aspect of these designs is we'll now focus on interactions. In fact, the whole idea of what we call factorial experiments stems from the fact that Fisher recognized that in a physical system, most of the inputs or factors to the system do not act independently or additively. It is their collective effects which is of interest. So the traditional one factor at a time experimentation has significant limitations because how a factor behaves in the presence of other factors changing is very different as in regards to how it might change in isolation. So one factor at a time experiments, Fisher recognized, had severe limitations and in fact often resulted in misleading characterizations of physical processes. And to give you an example, I'm going to show, um, in fact, let me go ahead and put on a slideshow for now. A simple factorial experiment, there are two factors at two levels, and we tend to call this a two-squared factorial. So we have two factors, A and B, at two levels. And as you can see on slide four, there are four unique settings. Plus, we could easily replicate these settings, so we would have a replicated full factorial experiment. Okay. So on the next slide, and I'm taking this example from a textbook I'm not using this semester by Lentner and Bishop, but I do give credit that this is their original case study. This is an experiment to study electroplating of uh, metal objects, in this case rods. There are two factors, the temperature of the bath in which the electroplating is done and the applied amperage to the parts. And there are six replicates for each of the four combinations, so there'd be a total of 24 measurements. And in the two by two table, if you'll notice, I give you in the uh, blue letters the average response. So if you take a look at this table on slide five, if we run at low amperage and we go from low temperature to high temperature, we go up about 0.6 micro inches of plating. The overall average is about 3.6, just the average between the low and the high. Well, what if we go to high amperage? Notice that we have an opposite effect. We go from 4.7 down to 3.1, or we lose about 1.6 micro inches. But you'll notice if we look at the overall average, we'd be misled. So on average, it looks like going from low to high amperage increases thickness. But take a close look at what we call the simple effects of amperage low across temperature and amperage high across temperature. It's completely the opposite. This is what we mean by an interaction. You can't talk about amperage by itself or temperature by itself. The two factors interact 
uh, in the physical system to produce, uh, in our case, a measured response of thickness. Okay. So going forward in the course, we're dealing with uh, factorial experiments. These interactions are important. And give Fisher credit, he recognized that scientists were not taking interaction effects into account, and he considered it a serious problem. And his factorial designs, one of their primary reasons uh, for their des um, development was to be able to estimate the interactions. Even today, there are many scientists who simply don't understand interactions, and they can continue to study one factor at a time in terms of a physical system and what they don't understand is the behavior of each factor in the system is not additive. So if you study each factor one at a time, add up their effects, it typically is not even close to representative of how the physical system actually behaves and we'll see this time and time again. So for the uh, electroplating example on slide 7, notice that we look at the size of the overall effects and notice that the amperage by temperature interaction is by far the largest effect. So what that's telling us, if you're going to really understand the electroplating process, you must understand amp amperage, you must understand temperature, and most important, you have to understand how they work together, how they interact. And this is the entire rationale for what we call factorial experimentation. And I illustrate this on slide 8, and if you'll notice, okay, on the left-hand side, notice I have low amperage, and at low amperage, the effect of raising temperature is positive. I go from a low to higher thickness. But look at the picture on the right. I go from, um, in other words, I move from low to high amperage, and then notice the effect of temperature is negative. So what this tells you is the simple effect of um, temperature is dramatically different depending upon whether I look at low amperage or high. So if you are going to control this process, you had better understand how these two factors interact with each other. Okay. And we typically um, visualize interactions through what are called interaction plots. So if you'll take a look uh, on slide 9, yeah, in fact, let me... Okay. Look at the upper right hand plot. Notice the x axis, you go from low to high temperature, and then there is a line for each level of amperage. So, if you're running at high amperage, then thickness goes down as you change temperature. If you're running at low amperage, thickness goes up. By the way, interactions are symmetric. Notice in the lower left-hand corner, we simply reverse uh, the roles of temperature and amperage, but we see the same effect. So frankly, for anyone really trying to understand the electroplating process, they're really going to have to understand these interactions. You can't study each factor by itself. In fact, it's futile and will lead to misunderstandings and misconceptions about what is really going on in this physical system. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, move forward. And again, I'm not going to, to look at jump right now. Um, Later on, we'll look at lots of interactions in jump. Okay. So I'm going to move forward a little bit and talk about the issue of uh, what we call heredity. 
that is when we look at interactions the interactions have a tendency to mask the main effects the individual or first order effects of the variables so I'm on slide 13 and notice in the leftmost uh, drawing okay notice you can see there is a strong interaction because the behavior of the response over A okay, is different depending upon whether you're running at B1 or B2. So you see in this case the two contours or lines cross each other. Okay. So what that tells you is indeed the effect of A depends upon the setting of B. But in this case, both factor A and factor B, on average, would not appear to be significant, but in combination, they're very important. In the middle is another type of interaction, and in this case, okay, main effect B appears significant, but main effect A does not. Why? Here's the average of A low, Here's the average of A high. On average, I'll just draw a picture, does not appear that A has any effect. Okay. That's why looking at main effects alone when there are interactions are very, very misleading. Because one has to take into account that interactions can overall mask the importance of main effects. And we'll see this time and time again going forward. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about an example from, um, this is again the book I mentioned, Lentner and, and Bishop, which I'm not using, I, and I'm deciding whether to use it going forward. But they have a nice example um, from chemical engineering. So chemical engineers are studying a process to produce a monomer and they have two factors catalyst amount and reactor pressure okay so in this case we have two factors and what we're interested in is determining one what is the effect of each of the individual factors and how do they interact and if you look at the bottom of slide 14, okay, remember uh, we've talked earlier about the sum of squares breakdown. Sum of squares total in ANOVA equals the sum of squares model plus the sum of squares error. What you should keep in mind at the bottom of the slide, the so-called sum of squares model, because there are two factors, now include three terms. The sum of squares for catalyst, the individual catalyst effect, the sum of squares pressure, the pressure effect, and then the sum of squares of the cross product. That is, we now have to take into account the interaction. Okay. So on slide 15 is an overall table of the effects. So notice there are three levels of catalyst, four levels of pressure. That means there are 12 unique factorial combinations, and each one of these combinations was replicated three times for a total of 36 runs. Frankly, this is in general a pretty big experiment for chemical synthesis doing 36 trials, but it's an interesting example, and apparently somebody was able to afford to run it. So we look carefully and notice in each cell you see the average of the three replicate runs. So I'm interested, is there an effective catalyst? Is there an effective pressure? And is there a combined interaction effect? So each cell, if you look at this, each cell is an average of three replicates. Notice that each total okay, is the sum of 12. 
In other words, overall, the average for each catalyst is the sum of 12 replicate measurements within each cell. If we look at it, it's R equals 3. And each overall effect of pressure is the sum of R equals 9 replicates or measurements. That comes into play when we do the, the calculation of the sum of squares. I'm not going to dwell on it too much because, quite frankly, these days everybody uses statistical software uh, to do the, the calculation of the effects, but I simply want everyone to understand where all of the calculations come from. Okay. So on slide 16, and I'm not going to ask people to do this, I show the formulas to calculate the sums of squares for catalyst, pressure, and the interaction. Okay. You need not uh, memorize these, but these are the standard formulas that would be used in a software package to calculate the sums of squares. Okay. And then the sum of squares error. Again, this would involve a lot of tedious calculation, but Typically, we actually calculate it by subtraction because remember, sum of squares total equals the sum of squares model plus the sum of squares error. So overall, if I know any two of the three, I can find the fourth. Okay. Okay. Now, in an earlier discussion, and we didn't uh, actually use the Lentner and Bishop book. So it used to be chapter two, I now call it one factor experiments. Um, we pointed out uh, an important concept and that is for an experimental factor with A levels, whatever A may be, the total sum of the effects over all the levels equals zero. And again, I'll show the reason for that is we measure the effects of each factor level with regard to the overall grand average. So when I talk about an effect of a factor, I'm talking about the shifts uh, in the response up or down away from the grand average. Given it's a grand average, those shifts better equal zero. Okay. So for this particular case, okay, remember there are three catalysts Okay. and there are four pressures. That means there are two degrees of freedom to estimate calculus, uh, catalyst, sorry, Freudian slip, to estimate uh, catalyst, and since there are four pressures, there are three degrees of freedom to estimate pressure. I will not repeat all of the information from um, the one-factor experiment. That means for an interaction, there are 2 times 3 equals 6. In other words, the interaction effects, they're in the interactions, their degrees of freedom are just the product of the two or three factors that feed into the interaction. So what does that tell us? It says, okay, overall, we require a set of 11 and I'm going to explain this in a moment, indicator variables. In other words, there are 11 degrees of freedom to uh, estimate all the experimental effects. Okay. There are two levels of catalyst. Okay. There are three levels of pressure. And there are six degrees of freedom for interactions, or 11. So altogether, we need to estimate 11 effects. So we say there are 11 degrees of freedom to estimate uh, the overall effects of the factors. Okay. So how does JUMP actually, in other statistical software, solve the problem? Well, the idea is I'm trying to build a statistical model. Okay. But in my model, since catalyst and pressure are treated as nominal, what I have are just three categories 
of catalyst for categories of pressure. Well, how do you build a model? Well, traditionally, the way we've done it in statistics to actually develop a predictive model, we convert those nominal factors okay, to a set of continuous indicator variables. Okay. So on slide 19 at the bottom, you see how jump changed the problem. So in fit model, you input that you wanted to measure catalyst, you wanted to measure pressure, you wanted to measure the interaction. Jump saw that they were nominal, and in the background, it created this table with 11 columns. There are 11 things I have to estimate in my model. Okay, notice there are two catalyst variables right here. three pressure variables, and overall, six interaction factors. So my nominal factors have now been turned into these arithmetic variables. And notice Jump's notation, catalyst A, catalyst B in parentheses, pressure with one in parentheses, and so forth. That's a signal to the user that these are uh, indicator or dummy variables created within Jump to estimate the model. Okay. And without going into too much detail, on slide 20, this is actually what the model would look like in what we call matrix form. And this middle matrix, all you're looking at basically are the indicator variables settings you saw on the previous slide. These were all created within Jump, and this is what's used to create the model, and then the model effects are estimated. Okay, so let's see if we can get over to Jump. Okay, let's see if we can open up find the example that we're looking for. Okay, so here's the raw data for the chemical experiment. So I go to fit model. And in my model, I have catalyst and pressure, plus I want the interaction. So under the macros button, these are little programs to create models for you. One of the options is a full factorial model. So it puts in each main effect, and then there's only one interaction because there are only two factors. And molecular weight is the response. So we're producing this monomer, and the response of interest is molecular weight. So click on Run. Okay. And I'll explain this output in a moment. But I'm going to, in the main report menu, I'm going to go to Save Columns, and at the bottom is Save Coding Table. Behind the scenes, once you define that model in Fit Model, Jump created what we're going to call uh, this model matrix or model data sheet. So in the jump analysis, you'll see things like catalyst with A in brackets or catalyst A by pressure 1 in brackets. That's a representation of the indicator or dummy variable that jump created in order to solve the problem and develop the predictive equation. Okay. So for catalyst A, there are three levels. I only need two indicator variables. Why? Because the overall effect of catalyst is zero. So if I know catalyst A, I know that effect, the catalyst B effect, then I don't need to see catalyst C because it's redundant. Because the, the effect of catalyst A plus the effect of catalyst B plus the effect of catalyst C equals 
equals zero. So there, I only need two indicator variables for catalyst and only three for pressure. Okay. So there, that's a total of two for catalyst, three for pressure, and guess what? That means to estimate the interaction, I need six. Two times three, six indicator variables. So behind the scenes, and again, to most users, uh, you would never look at this data table, but this is what Jump has created in the background. And this is what statistical software has been doing for decades, and what also people have had to do by hand traditionally. Okay. So we look at the results, and notice that Jump does a breakdown. So you get the sum of squares catalyst, the sum of squares pressure, and the sum of squares interaction, and you see the breakdown in the degrees of freedom. Okay. Basically, this is how one analyzes an experiment using ANOVA when both of the factors are nominal. Okay. Okay. Again, keep in mind um, the fact, and this is at the bottom of Slide 21, this is critical. The sum to zero constraints are the only reason we can really solve the ANOVA problem. Again, the reason these sum to zero constraints make sense, and this was Fisher's idea, we measure those effects with respect to the grand average. So given the grand average is basically the center of gravity of your data, for instance, for factor A, there are three levels. So the shifts of A up or down around the grand average have to be zero. Similarly for B and for the interactions. So altogether, there are 19 possible parameters in this model. There are three parameters for uh, catalyst. There are four parameters for pressure, and then there are a total of 12 different interaction terms for a total of 19. The good news is, because we use this sum to zero constraint, that is, we measure the effects with respect to the grand average, I don't need to estimate 19 parameters. I only have to estimate 11. The other eight are redundant based upon the sum to zero constraint. So in an ANOVA table, you wouldn't see 19 estimated effects. You'd see 11 because we know that the other eight are redundant. Okay. And I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into the weeds on these analyses. I just want you to be aware of it. So I think I'm just going to go over to jump. And I'm going to show you what's called the parameter estimates table. Okay. So here, in the estimates column, are the estimated effects, okay. the intercept plus the 11 effects. Again, there are nine more. Oh, let me see. Oh, yep. I mean, I'm sorry. There's eight more plus the intercept. We don't estimate them, they're redundant. If you'd like to see them in Jump, if you click on the main report menu, okay, and under estimates, ask for expanded estimates. Okay. So this one shows you all of the effects, and if you look carefully, you'll notice the sum to zero constraints. Okay. So just to take a look, here's catalyst A, B, and C. If you add A and B together, okay, C is the negative of that sum. So C is redundant. So traditionally, we wouldn't even show C in the ANOVA table. Remember this notation. When you see the variable with one of its settings in the square brackets, 
that's a new variable jump created, an indicator variable, and we create the set of indicator variables, and that's how we actually solve the ANOVA problem. Okay. Okay. And uh, the next few slides illustrate these calculations, and I'm not going to really worry about it. And you can also do uh, in jump, I'll actually go to this uh, and show you. You can actually do contrasts. Okay. So I'm in jump, and you have these what are called effect details. These are additional reports for each of the terms in the model. Okay. So let's look at catalyst and pressure. So I want to do a contrast. I'm going to do least squares means and potentially do some contrast. Okay. Here's what's going on. The least squares mean, we covered this earlier, is nothing more than the average for each cell combination. So catalyst A, pressure 1, there are three replicates. The average is just 10.67. And then down below, you see what is an interaction plot. The x-axis is the three, uh, four pressures. Then there's a line for each level of catalyst. If this system were additive, that is, no interactions, all of the three profiles would be parallel. They're not. That indicates that some sort of interaction behavior is actually occurring. So again, when you see least squares means, it's an old term in statistics, this is your model prediction of the response okay, for uh, each of the settings of the factors. So what if I wanted to make comparisons? Like I wanted to compare catalyst A, pressure 1, to say catalyst C, pressure 1. Well, that's what we call a contrast. And typically, these are determined by subject matter experts. So if I click on the Catalyst by Pressure report menu, notice I can do uh, compare each pair. That is, Jump will compare all of the possible combinations using uh, t-tests. And anywhere that you see red lettering, it means the differences are significant. But remember, these are a lot of comparisons using students' T, and there's a high false discovery rate. So you can also go ahead and do the um, Tukey Kramer honestly significant difference. Okay. And notice Tukey Kramer only finds one difference. Uh, catalyst C, pressure 4, to Catalyst B, pressure 1. You can see it in the report. So the two don't agree, but remember, Tukey Kramer tries to reduce the false discovery rate, does it at the expense of power to find real differences, but we have the usual trade-off. The compare each pair of student T procedure finds more differences, it's more powerful. Unfortunately, it finds more false discoveries. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the notes, and they step you through these uh, different procedures. And then you can actually do individual um, contrasts. For instance, here I'm comparing, uh, let's see, comparing Catalyst A pressure to to Catalyst C, Pressure 3. So I'll go back to, and again, when I talk about a contrast, let's see, I'll have to go here. All I'm talking about is you're taking a difference between different uh, settings of the factors, and you're seeing if there's a significant mean difference. So I'll hit, hit Recall. Going to remove the leverage plots. We're really not going to use them. Okay. There we 
we go. So I'm going to go to Catalyst and Pressure. And instead of doing all possible comparisons, maybe I pick a few. Again, these are driven by subject matter experts. So let's say I want to compare okay, Catalyst A Pressure 1 to Catalyst B Pressure 3. I'll just pick a couple of these. Okay. So I want to contrast to maybe those two particular settings are of interest to you. And I can do multiple different contrasts. The key is these are very specific targeted contrasts that you want to look at. So maybe I look at A2 minus B1. Okay. So when I'm done, what Jump does, it does whatever uh, t-test you ask it to do. Notice that the contrast of Catalyst A pressure 2 to Catalyst B pressure 1 is statistically significant. There appears to be a big difference when I compare Catalyst A pressure 1 to Catalyst B pressure 3 doesn't appear to be a significant difference. So sometimes to subject matter experts those very specific contrasts between specific treatment levels can be of considerable interest to them in terms of uh, their specific scientific questions that they're asking. Okay, So I'm going to stop at this point and I'm going to do one more um, video discussing what's called, and this is an interesting experiment on shrimp farming.